Good afternoon. On behalf of the AGS Council, our members, and staff of the American Geographical Society, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Geography 2050, The Future of Mobility, our fourth annual symposium in the Geography 2050 series. Since our founding in 1851, AGS has dedicated itself for 166 years to leading the cause for geography and geospatial science in the United States. We seek to broaden the horizons of geographic awareness and knowledge, and this horizon is reaching more scientific institutions, academic fields, and geographically minded companies with every passing year. We bridge gaps and promote connections between leaders and organizations that might not otherwise have the opportunity to interact. AGS is the only organization committed to bringing together business, academia, public policy leaders, not-for-profits, and the general public in order to further our understanding of the role of geography and geospatial science have in our lives. Some of the new members of our community are the AGS Geography Teacher Fellows. These colleagues of ours represent the very best of teachers in the United States, and we are very proud that they are joining us today. This year, as we did at last year's symposium, we welcome 50 new teacher fellows into the program. These are the people who are directly inspiring a new generation of geo-minded students. They are the best of the best, some of the finest teachers in our country. I invite our new AGS Geography teacher fellows, as well as the returning teacher fellows from last year, to rise and be recognized by all of us for your hard work and dedication. This program would not have been possible without Boundless, who has sponsored this program for the second year in a row. Tony Deary, Anthony Calamito, Brian Monheiser, and the whole team at Boundless have had the foresight from the beginning to understand the need to have geogra geography teachers joining us in geographical and geospatial leadership. They have brought the AGS Geography Teacher Fellows Program not only financial assistance, but in-kind collaboration throughout the year as we look for new ways to support the work of geography teachers across the nation. We would also like to thank Mapbox. Mapbox is partnering with us this year and providing the resources for this morning's Mapathon in which our teachers participated. The ability to use maps to make business decisions, tell stories, and better understand our world is becoming more and more a part of the AP Human Geography curriculum across the U.S. And the commitment of the Mapbox team, including Brian Housel, is enabling teachers to develop their own mapping skills. And this is exactly the kind of support we need if we're to be ready for 2050. Finally, we want to give special thanks to the Fund for the City of New York for their support in sponsoring and hosting the Teacher Fellow Workshop that will be held this coming Saturday. FCNY, under the guidance of its president, Mary McCormick, welcomed AGS into its partner project about a year and a half ago. And since then, we have very quickly come to realize that there are many projects in which AGS and FCNY can work together. Although diverse in the types of organizations with which they work, we could not have a better partner dedicated to geography and geospatial science than FCNY. As Mary likes to say, we get it. They understand the importance of what geography and geospatial science means to this country, and their sponsorship of our workshop on Saturday is just one example of how supportive they are in what AGS is doing. This year's focus, the future of mobility, finds us examining a topic that while extensively talked about and covered in the media, most of the discussions to date really have not been dealt with from a geographical perspective. No matter where you live, your life is probably dominated by transportation and movement, and the geographical and geospatial implications of this are enormous. I am confident that the lineup of speakers we have for you over the next two days is going to cause you to think about this topic from a different view. And we really have the people who are pushing the edge of what has to be labeled a revolution. There is little I can add to what they are going to discuss. But as we go forward, I would like to leave you with just one thought that I ask you to keep in mind over the next two days. 
What is happening in mobility is mind-blowing. It is game-changing and overall awesome. But the thing that makes the topic so incredible to me is the speed at which all of this is happening. And this speed issue has caused me to look at mobility differently. When I see someone parallel parking on the street, I now look to see if the person who is driving has their hands on the steering wheel. Because I know that there are cars already out there parking without the help of their drivers. When I hear about drones, I no longer think of an expensive toy for my son, but rather I wonder when CVS is going to start using them to bring me my cough medicine in the middle of the night so I don't have to go out. And when I think about going to Washington, D.C., I don't focus on wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to waste half a day traveling, and instead I wonder when Hyperloop construction and why it hasn't started already. So in some very subtle ways, I'm thinking differently about all of this, and I hope that by the end of this symposium, you will too. So let's get to it. At the helm of the AGS Council is a leadership duo that represents one of the strengths of AGS, bringing groups together that ordinarily do not have the opportunity to interact. Dr. Chris Tucker, our chairman, is an entrepreneur, a businessman, and exactly what we expect out of Washington today a very successful, non-conforming, occasionally graphic in his choice of words, tweeting happy dealmaker who has brought to AGS the world of geospatial science and crazy entrepreneurs who love geography. I don't know quite how he does it, but the ranks of our society have not only grown in numbers, but the diverse nature in who he finds to be our new colleagues is really amazing. Dr. Marie Price, our president, brings a career of internationally recognized geographical expertise in immigration and globalization. Her reputation as a renowned professor is echoed over and over again by the countless students she has mentored and who follow in her footsteps to explore and lead geography and geospatial science. Marie not only has the admiration of her academic colleagues, but also commands respect across all groups of professionals that make up AGS. In her research, her teaching, and generally in her personality. She epitomizes the ultimate use of geography and geospatial science for the betterment of humankind. Together, Chris and Marie have continued in the tradition of their predecessors. And I know on behalf of everyone who knows either of them, we are so proud to have you lead us. Ladies and gentlemen, our chairman, Dr. Chris Tucker, and our president, Dr. Marie Price. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to see you all here. When we dream up these events and invite speakers, we anticipate this day, and to have it finally here is a great joy. Uh, the AGS has existed for a long time. 1851, nobody in this room was around then. Maybe you had great grandparents or great grandparents who were around then. Geographical organizations such as AGS were created ar around the world uh, in the mid-19th and early 20th century because there is a basic human need to know about places we live, to explore them, map them, measure them, see how they've changed, improve their connectivity, and, and if possible, make them better. AGS just happens to be the oldest such national organization in the United States. We thrive today because in this room, there is a body of hardworking women and men who gave their time, their talent, and their treasure to shape this organization and support its many initiatives. Can the members of the AGS Council please stand and remain standing? Give them a hand. Don't sit down yet, Joe. Get up. The, the council is an industrious brigade of geo-enthusiasts who I have the pleasure to work with and represent. The synergy of this group comes from our collaborations across sectors. Collectively, we're from business, government, and academia. The council is an ideas factory. And more importantly, its members roll up their sleeves and put their ideas into action. They are also a fun-loving group, seriously. 
<laughs> Stick around, you'll see what I mean. So before you leave this conference today, look around, see these counselors, introduce yourself to at least one of them, let them know why you're here, what you've learned, and uh, what you'd like to learn. Thank you, counsel, you may sit down. <clears throat> Admittedly, not everyone shares our love of geography, uh, nor do people fully understand the value of geographic literacy and geospatial thinking. As some students tell me, can't we just Google it? Uh, but we believe at the AGS in a global age rich in geospatial technology that geographic literacy has never been more important. Which brings me to a story I read in Outside Magazine about a year ago, which featured uh, an American, Noel Santian, who traveled to Iceland. He was not an experienced traveler, just another guy from New Jersey looking for adventure. He landed at Kevlak Airport, about 20 miles from the capital of Reykjavik, entered the name of the hotel address in his GPS, and about nine hours later reached a small hamlet 380 kilometers north of his intended destination. When he asked a local villager, Siri was her name, I'm not kidding, <laughs> where the city was, she was stunned. How could he have missed it? Well, it turns out the Icelandic language has lots of vowel consonant combinations not used in English, and just a couple innocent spelling mistakes explain the misdirection. But this is where social media kicked in. Siri posted on Facebook this absurd story. A friend of Siri's wrote a blog post about it, and soon, the media was in on the joke and at the doorstep of Knowles Hotel. Two days later, when he reached the capital, he had become a hashtag, lost tourist. <laughs> Strangers were calling Noel by name on the street. He was world famous in Iceland. Noel's story has a happy ending, but it suggests how disconnected some people are from their basic geographic understanding. Some of this can be explained by a blind faith in technology, but it also shows a stunning lack of spatial understanding. Neuroscientists tell us that those who frequently navigate complex environments through identifying landmarks literally grow their brains. So geographic literacy and geospatial thinking is good for your head. As we launch this exploration into the future of mobility, we don't want anyone to be a lost tourist. Through AGS publications, daily geo posts, social media presence, map contests, council fellowships for student research, we are growing the next generation of geographically aware and geospatially savvy citizens. We're also committed to making geographic service a key component of our outreach to students, teachers, and the public. This morning, we hosted a mapathon with 50 AP human geography teachers mapping the border between the US and Mexico around Nogales in OpenStreetMap with the intent that our teachers bring these skills to their students using open source platforms and satellite imagery. We have the capacity to build the map of human settlement uh, in often neglected or overlooked places. So as we build out service, one of the things we do is encourage uh, high school students to become junior service fellows, those who get a three, four, and five in AP human geography, and then provide some geographic service. And one of the ways they do that is earning geo badges. So there is more to geography than learning where the Nile is. So now that I have in, whet your appetite for what AGS does, I invite Chris Tucker, my uh, other half here on this tool, dual team of Jack and Jill of Geography, and we will explain the origins of Geography 2050 and what we're about to do this afternoon. Take it away, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. 
So who's here for the first time? Raise your hand. Who has been to every single Geography 2050? Raise your hand. All right. So from humble beginnings four years ago, uh, we have grown this into a multi-year strategic dialogue about the vital trends that will reshape the geography of our planet. I, when I was speaking with the teachers this morning, I, I, I used one of my commonly used lines, which is, plate tectonics isn't going to move the actual physical geography of our planet very far in our lifetimes. But humans will. It's the human geography that will completely transmogrify the surface of our planet by 2050. And there are no other bodies of people that are actually thinking uh, about the, the actual where, uh, the when and where of that. There are many disciplines that talk about overpopulation or urbanization, uh, all topics that we have covered in previous Geography 2050s. But through the geographic lens or through the lens of spatiotemporal uh, data and understanding, we can actually see where things are going in many ways from the, the past change that we observe. So thank you for coming. Uh, without being able to convene people from across all these different sectors, uh, we just live in our own little echo chamber, uh, talking to ourselves about our own observations. By bringing people together from various fields of practice and from scholarship, uh, we have the promise of an actual dialogue uh, uh, that involves all these different perspectives from uh, across our country. Geography in many ways is uh, the, the field that allows us to bring together our collective observations about the world so that we individually can see over a horizon that we would never be able to see uh, on our own. That's not just a geographic horizon, but in the case of Geography 2050, it's a temporal horizon. So this year we focused on mobility. Uh, the AGS has actually been involved in the mobility business for a very long time, ever since helping survey for the Transcontinental Railroad uh, back in the 1800s and, and being involved in that. It is, I would say, undeniable that mobility and trends in mobility uh, are probably the most impactful uh, trends when we look at how the planet has changed. Railroads, highways, digging canals, uh, airplanes. These are all things that have happened in the past century and century and a half. Um, and they have utterly transformed the geography of our planet. But yet there's a whole new host of mobility innovations that are now on the rise. Uh, you can't read the news without seeing something about drones or about the Hyperloop or autonomous driving cars. Uh, you can put together a list of 20 or 30 different kinds and we're going to cover as many of those 20 or 30 in this day and a half uh, conference as we possibly can. Every one of them have geographic implications and implications for a future planet. In previous years, uh, we really put this together um, uh, from a, we bootstrapped it. The council bootstrapped it with whatever knowledge we had. We were very fortunate to uh, have someone new join our council, uh, Dean Wise, who will be uh, coming up here momentarily, who has a, a, a lifelong uh, experience in mobility. He's a railroad guy from way back, but as we know, railroads touch everything else. Um, uh, they, we have all these transmodal uh, interfaces to every other kind of transportation. It's all integrated. And when I met Dean and we started talking about mobility, it was obvious who was going to be our symposium chair for this year. Um, and a lot of the variety that you're going to see in the program today, um, it just keeps better, get, getting better and better over the years uh, in, in, in this case because we have a true leader in the world of mobility uh, who had an amazing Rolodex of people that he could call from all over the world to participate in our program. So what you're getting ready to enjoy uh, is, is uh, in no small part due to Dean. We are also very fortunate to have another uh, new counselor, uh, Andrea, where's Andrea? Oh, sitting there also. Um, Andrea D'Amato, who uh, is also lived in the world of transportation and infrastructure, also a geographer. You're both undergrad geographers and master, master's degree in geography. Um, so who are living in the world of practice, living in the world of mobility. So if you're wondering what would geographers ever do to make the world of mobility uh, better, go talk to Andrea and go talk to Dean and it'll become obvious uh, uh, pretty quickly. So um, 
With that said, I'd love to introduce our, or bring up on the stage our symposium chair for this year, uh, Dean. Um, Dean, as I said, is a lifelong railroad guy, uh, but he's also lived across many sectors of mobility, and he'll even talk your ear off about drones. If there's something cool going on, like the Hyperloop test track, or you know the, the Uber Elevate flying taxi conference or something, Dean's there, and he's sending an email, email to me going, oh, this is cool. We got to you know, involve these guys in our conference. So Dean, you've been all over the world. You know, where, where, are you, uh, where are you living these days? Uh, well, first of all, before I tell you the answer to that, welcome everybody to New York City. Good to see you. Um, this is not just a geography conference. It's a transportation conference. I came from a big railroad, which is a big transportation company. We always start our, our day with a safety briefing. And that's true of every transportation company because safety is number one. So here's our quick safety briefing for Geography 2050. You're in Lerner Hall, Columbia. Broadway is right out there. In case of fire, we'll all go out on Broadway, take a right, and convene around in the quad. If there's inclement weather, which you're not expecting, we'll hunker down and wait for the security to tell us what to do. Who's here qualified in CPR? Very good, thank you for doing that, but we're gonna rely on James, who's our security officer here, who is also qualified in CPR, and he is within minutes of getting in the, uh, the paramedics a block away, the fire department a block away, and a hospital a block away. So we are in good hands with the, the ecosphere of safety that this uh, college uh, university brings to us. So all I would really ask you to do uh, is be, be, be safe, Look around you and watch out for tripping hazards, the computers, the bags, keep them out of the way and watch where you're going. And folks, always fast your seatbelt and no texting while driving. So literally, this is how every meeting at a railroad it's, it's starts. It's good practice. With I, a I with commend a you to debrief. all do it with your family in your basement before the Super Bowl safety briefing. It raises awareness, okay? It saves lives. We all want to get home safe. So, um, so I just moved from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, 30 miles west of Dallas, which is the headquarters of BNSF, uh, this year, and I moved to Boston. Uh, and um, Chris, how about you? Where do you live? I live down in D.C., came up on okay. track. Okay, D.C. Yeah, um, yeah. Looks about right. Okay, and you're, you're wondering where else I've been this year, yeah, right? Yeah, where, where have you been, Dean? Yeah, I, well, I, I've actually been fortunate. I was on vacation in uh, Palm Beach area last week. Hmm. I know that was, a, that was tough duty, especially watching as things were unfolding here. That was great. I had a chance to go to Moscow on business recently. Hmm. Uh, was also in London just two weeks ago on business. That's so funny. I've been getting around, as you pointed out, um, and was uh, been to Chicago and uh, also to L.A. Ah, but I know you get around as well. Where yeah. have you been? Yeah, geez. I mean, where have I been? Um, well, uh, no, I've been in New Delhi too, Chris. Oh, I forgot geez. to mention that. Yeah, you've been, that was you've a really great trip. Where else have you been? God, uh, yeah. I mean, I've been in San Francisco three, four times this year. Uh, God, Silicon Valley traffic's even worse. Yeah, Atlanta. Uh, that was an interesting trip. Paris, London. The London traffic was even worse than the Paris traffic. Um, Houston. Yeah, yeah. That's that wasn't fun either. Okay. Um, so, so I think let's stop. I mean, I think we got a problem here, don't we? Yeah, it's that traffic. It's, we got I a think mobility we have problem. a mobility problem, and why? And why? Look, look at uh, yeah everywhere. You've all been there. It all looks like that. And these are certainly rush hour pictures, but we are trapped in our own success. And what are we going to do about it? Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like we're just a bunch of frogs in a pot, and we're just uh, slowly boiling, and uh, I don't know, maybe we'll all just die in traffic together. <laughs> and uh, we have 7.6 billion people. I think by 2050, which is our, our uh, theme, we will have another 2.2 billion people. That's 29% more. And most of them will be a lot wealthier and will want to travel more. So, by the way, when I was in India at the, going to all the sites, I saw more Indians than anybody else, and, and that's, a, that's just the tip of the iceberg in the middle class growth in India. Go to India now because you won't be able to get in there when all the middle class Indians are, are at the Taj Mahal. So we got a problem, it's a problem today. How do we solve it for 2050? I don't know, I mean, we've got a lot of big challenges ahead of us. We've got safety challenges, got issues of just efficiency and how we run our cities. A lot of congestion. I mean, the sustain sustainability implications of this are just kind of remarkably frightening. Um, but maybe all the new we're, digital We're, we're killing 1.2 million people a year. Yeah. Worldwide. Yeah. 
right? Uh, but maybe all these technologies, autonomous cars, electric vehicles, flying taxis, hyperloops, I don't know, maybe they'll help us uh, get out of the mess we're in? That's why we're here, Chris, oh, thank you. All right. So uh, the theme here, the dynamics are really uh, multi-dimensional. We, we, uh, we have a very broad scope and we don't, we're not gonna be able to, we could do a day on each of our panels, but we're gonna be looking at mobility and not long-term migration, uh, as many geographers uh, think about that as mobility, but really how do we get around and how does our stuff get around, our freight? We're also looking at uh, uh, the technology as the trigger, because we may be heading into the biggest transformation of ever in terms of technology. We've seen, as Chris said, we've seen lots of technology tra uh, transformations for mobility over thousands of years. Uh, we're going to look at uh, this, this new one, the, the, the transformational tech, digital age. We're looking at all modes of transports, bikes to Hyperloop. We're looking at all geographies, and, you, and you'll see we have airspace, we have cities today, and we have, we have uh, regions. Um, and we're taking a long-term view at the spatial implications. So the question we raise, and we know it'll be very hard to answer, is what will the world look like, the world geography look like in 2050? So how do, we, how do you answer that question? Uh, it's, it's not easy. So here's, here's a, a fun fact. Tw uh, 2017 is to 2050 is 1984 is to 2017. Ooh. Who read 1984 when they're like 20 years old and, and like were afraid to ever get me, I, I, was, you know, I was way before 1984, afraid to hit 1984. A lot of us, right? So we know, and, and, and George Orwell, who wrote it, by the way, 35 years before, he wrote it in 49, to, for 1984, he was wrong. We didn't see that, luckily, that dose dystopian atmosphere. So in 1984, what were some of the transportation highlights? Well, there's some fun ones. First minivan from Chrysler. Chrysler. We've come a long way since then, right? The first women uh, actually went on spacewalks, first a Russian, then an American. Virgin Atlantic opened for business. And of course, the Macintosh came along, Apple Mac. Think of all those implications. But you know, those 30 years, uh, or 33 years since then, I think are gonna be much uh, less uh, dynamic than the next 30 years. And the way we uh, are trying to think about it, and we've encouraged all of our moderators to do so, is to use a few techniques. And I'll, I'll just touch on these, but you'll see there's a little packet, a little uh, white paper, so to speak, in your packet that describes these and how we're doing it. Tailwinds and headwinds. We have more tailwinds from social benefits, as Chris pointed out, to improve safety, to improve congestion, to improve um, uh, the uh, efficiency of the vehicles and sustainability if we go to electric cars. So the public sector is really behind this to make it work. Uh, number two, scenarios. Let's not, let's not go for one particular forecast. Let's look at the four corners of the tennis court and really debate it. And to do that, we also want to introduce this idea of second and third order effects. Again, read your book. So, but we think of second order effect as the spatial impact that you can see with your eyes and as the city unfolds. As the city changes in 20, 30 years from now, What's, what are we gonna see uh, from all this transformation? And then the third order effects are the invisible effects, the flows, the patterns, the freight patterns. And we're gonna explore those in some of the panels as well. Uh, and also to do that, we're gonna introduce something, uh, and I give Bern Grush, who's a later speaker, a concept called dueling narratives. It's really the point counterpoint. What do you mean by dueling narratives? Oh, glad you asked, Chris. So as we look at a city landscape, do we think that we'll be, we'll be developing that landscape w because of uh, the new technologies into a beautiful green space with birds chirping? Yeah, right, or, or will there just be a whole bunch more urban sprawl that, you know, the transportation just makes completely uncontrollable? Or kind of like Detroit, dystopia. What about, uh, some think that the um, transit will actually be better off with all these new technologies because we'll be able to create door-to-door -door seamless services with the Ubers and the Lyfts connecting to transit. Yeah, or I mean, will that competition, you know, they, they just compete with our public transit and kind of undermine public investment in public transit, leading everything to go to hell in a handbasket? Exactly. Which way is it going to go? Well, those are the kind of things we want you as the audience to listen to. Listen to these themes, understand them, push the dialogue to what will 2050 really look like and how do I better inform myself to think about which way it's going to go? And, and let's spread the word on that. And we think geography as a lens is going to be a really important way to do it. And I uh, really challenge all of you to say, do we, can we actually come up with a vision that is going to reduce congestion, that's going to improve access for all people, that's going to be more efficient, that's going to be more sustainable by 2050 through all the things we'll talk about, and what's the path to get there? So let's get started.